Good morning. It seems only fitting that we begin today with prayer. This is from the Prayers for the Consecration of a Church from page 578 in the Book of Common Prayer. Let us thank God whom we worship here in the beauty of holiness. Eternal God, the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, much less the walls of temples made with hands. Graciously receive our thanks for this place and accept the work of our hands offered to your honor and glory. For the church universal, of which these visible buildings are the symbol, we thank you, Lord. For your presence, whenever two or three have gathered together in your name, we thank you, Lord. For this place where we may be still and know that you are God, we thank you, Lord. For making us your children by adoption and grace, and refreshing us day by day with the bread of life, we thank you, Lord. For the knowledge of your will and the grace to perform it, we thank you, Lord. For the fulfilling of our desires and petitions as you see best for us, we thank you, Lord. For the pardon of our sins, which restores us to the company of your faithful people, we thank you, Lord. For the blessing of our vows and the crowning of our years with your goodness, we thank you, Lord. For the faith of those who have gone before us, and for our encouragement by their perseverance, we thank you, Lord. For the fellowship of St. Philip, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and all your saints, we thank you, Lord. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Amen. As I noted in my short homily earlier today, this has been a challenging year. But it has been one that we have worked through together. And it's hard to overstate how grateful I am to so many here in this place, and I will thank people throughout this presentation. I'm going to spend more time reviewing the past year than I normally do in an annual meeting address. I usually try and use these addresses to look ahead and talk about what is to come. My hope is that we use the coffee hour times, the Q&A sessions on Sundays in February, to do some of that vision casting work together as we share what we hope lies ahead. I'd be remiss, though, if I didn't begin with just a broad and general thank you to each of you. When this pandemic began, I was more than anxious that we'd be facing not just the prospect of financial hardship, but the much more dire possibility that many of us would become sick and that we'd lose people we love to COVID. I am so thankful to each of you for staying as safe as possible. I'm also thankful to each of you for understanding the measures we have taken this past year to keep our church community safe and to keep the wider community safe around us. Some did get COVID, and for some it was a real challenge. But the cases in our congregation were few, and we as a congregation have come to this Sunday healthier than I feared. We've also come through healthier financially than we had any reason to expect. And it was your faithful giving and generosity that made that happen. Some have had to cut back on giving because of the economy, and we understand that completely. Others have helped make up the difference, and for that I am deeply grateful. That giving has enabled the work I'm going to talk about in this presentation. It has enabled us to worship and care and connect and reach out and so much more in so many new ways in a time when it is so needed. In my sermon, I noted that our faith is about more than just what we do or say we believe. It is about who we are, and I am proud to say that we are a church that has been faithful and generous in making sure the resources for ministry have been there this year. And we have been faithful and generous in caring for one another in new ways. Thank you. As we look to the years ahead and think about what matters to us and how we want to sustain it, that has naturally led to some conversations about long-term sustainability and legacy giving. So Sally Larson from the Ministry Endowment and Funds Trust working with Jane Prescott-Smith from Preservation and Endowment, 
and Bonnie Wynn, our stewardship chair, are working on a plan to reach out to talk to folks about longer-term giving. The Book of Common Prayer directs all clergy to talk once per year about leaving the church in our wills. And so now I have done just that. But Jane and Sally and Bonnie may talk with you more about the options in the months ahead. This past year, I am deeply thankful to our vestry, Sonny Ball, Nancy Atherton, Mary Cutting, Michael Linton, Katie Fouts, Lee Shaw, Chelsea Bailey, Mark Woodhams, David Haas, Elizabeth Wood, and Mary Margaret Sprinkle, along with our treasurer, Herb Burton. They endured at the beginning of the pandemic weekly vestry meetings. For those of you who suffered under monthly vestry meetings, you should know that that is quite a sacrifice. But they used those weekly meetings to make hard decisions facing unprecedented challenges and did it in a way that was faithful and prayerful and committed not only to the health of this congregation, but to the health of the wider community around us. I want to especially thank those vestry members who are stepping down this year, my, which include Mary Cutting, Michael Linton, and Katie Fouts. I want to thank those who have decided to be on our vestry slate who have accepted that call, Michael Anderson, Megan Hodge, and Barbara Cohn. Nancy Atherton, our junior warden for the last couple of years, is stepping down this year. And I want to thank her. Many of you will know the immense commitment she shows to those in need around us in the community. She is a regular at our food bank and in every other way that we serve those who are at the margins. Uh, she brought that commitment to the vestry, to her role as junior warden, and for that, I am immensely grateful. Our incoming junior warden is someone who is known to many of you, Mary Margaret Sprinkle. She's a former senior warden of St. Philip's, and I'm delighted that she's bringing her gifts and her experience to this role. On the administrative side, I want to thank some other folks, Herb Burton, Bonnie Wynn, and Bob Couch, for their leadership and wisdom and willingness to always do whatever needs to be done, whether it is dealing with stucco and roof repairs, tracking investments, managing a pledge campaign, or just coming in and stuffing envelopes at the last minute. They have shown a remarkable dedication to this place and a willingness to just do whatever needs to be done. Bob Couch and Pam Henderson and Aidan Carroll and so many more have helped us sustain the grounds and gardens, and they've done this painstaking work like re-irrigating the Perry Garden this past year. So when you come back, when we're able to gather together again, you will see that the place has been well cared for, and I thank them for that. There are other thanks to, like to <clears throat> Herb Burton and Sonny and Bob for helping with our internet upgrade. And there are so many things that happen in the life of a parish that we never see, and there are so many people we don't see doing it. So thank you to all those who have helped with these behind the scenes changes and transitions. I wanna thank our church staff. I honestly do not know another team that could have handled the issues of this past year so quickly, so competently, and so faithfully. You will hear more as I go on about all that has been done this past year, but it is the way it has been done always with an eye toward how we can be as faithful and responsible as possible. It's the way that it has been done that has been so moving. It has been a gift to have this group of colleagues in this time, and I have been more aware this year than any of not just what hard workers or competent people they are, but of just what wonderful human beings they all are. This is a year when they have lent me their faith, hope, and courage, and for that I am thankful. In the life of a congregation and the life of church staff, transitions do happen. This year, this summer, we will say goodbye to Lois Britton, who is retiring, and to Mother Kelly Joyce, who is going on to graduate school. Now, in the vein of things that people don't see, let me tell you a little bit about what Lois has done. So many cost-saving changes and initiatives in the last several years. There was a cleaning firm change that replaced uh, Sexton Rolls to save money. We changed from quick Books and to QuickBooks and Breeze replacing ACS, Comcast replacing Bluespan for lower cost and better service, and she has overseen four years of audits being completed. She did work on the PPP loan that we were awarded this past year and has really done two jobs, finance and administration, but also facilities, and she is ready to pitch in for whatever needs to be done at any time. I asked some of the staff to give me a comment or two about working with Lois, and here's what they had to say, and I'm gonna keep it anonymous. 
The first said, Lois is the knower of all things. When I can't figure something out on my own, I know that Lois not only can help, she will do it with patience and kindness. Someone else said, Lois has always had a wonderfully supportive and, dare I say it, motherly presence in the office. She has helped with many financial and logistical issues, regardless of whether the problem fell under her purview or not. She has faithfully exuded warmth and kindness and made my arrival at St. Philip's smoother than it would have been otherwise. Someone else said, thanks to Lois for always being the consummate professional in keeping us all grounded and in being a model of servant goodness through all the many changes of staffing and parish ups and downs and ups during her time with us. Someone else said, Lois's warm heart was on full display from the first time I met her. She welcomed me immediately as a colleague and is always ready to help with a smile. Lois's calm demeanor and ready humor are ever present, looming deadlines, a line of people outside her door, or an early morning last minute request, nothing frazzles her. She is a reassuring presence who will be sorely missed by all. Finally, someone said, Lois, I will always appreciate her good humor, the strength of her moral backbone, her cleverness and creativity, and that she did so much so often to raise spirits and morale. We will say much more, of course, as we draw closer to the official retirement date. And we'll say more about Mother Kelly, too, as we draw closer to the time when she leaves us for graduate school. One of her colleagues said, Kelly has a gift in bringing the gospel message alive in her sermons. Someone else said, Mother Kelly has created countless publications, advertisements, video compilations over the years, patiently with us musicians in that process. I'm grateful for the passion she clearly has for the church, which she tempers with generosity of spirit. She will make a formidable graduate student. Someone else said, it has been such a gift to have been a small part of witnessing new ministry leaders grow in their call as part of St. Philip's. Blessings to Mother Kelly as she embarks on this next stage of her journey. With thanks for her many gifts shared with us. And finally, someone said it would be hard to say how much I appreciate Kelly, but her steadfastness, her commitment to faith, her love of the church, doesn't blunt her critique of it, but lends those critiques an authentic fierceness of love. Her energy, the keenness of her intellect, and her sermons have enriched my own faith, and she has helped me fall more deeply in love with Jesus and with the church. As Lois and Kelly leave us, we are looking at a range of options to ensure that the work they do continues, and we will reorganize office and communications work for whatever comes next uh, through the course of this year. Part of what will come next is worship. We have had to change the way we have done worship for the last year, as you all know. And it's worth reviewing just how much worship has been done. In 2020 through January 31st, 2021, we have had 43 Sundays online. Now, the total number of services in 2019 through January 30th, 31st, 2020 was 388 services. That was the previous year. This past year in 2020, we had 255 services of morning prayer, 264 celebrations of the Eucharist, 519 services. I am glad to say we prayed more, not less, during this pandemic year. We had to do it all online. We began on March 24th, the Feast of Oscar Romero, doing online morning prayer and Holy Communion. And it has been a gift to watch those services and it has sustained my faith in fresh and surprising ways, even as I long for us all to be together in person. We did some baptisms, small weddings and funerals as we were able. We did four baptisms this past year, three weddings that were postponed and 13 funerals were postponed. We did do nine small weddings in the chapel, nine weddings in a pandemic year. We completed 30 days of memorials through All Souls, where we read the names of every departed parishioner from St. Philip's history. On Advent and Christmas, we sent out a devotional booklet for individuals and families, mailed to over 800 households, and we have an eye towards sending out a Lenten devotional book as well. We had four virtual retreats led by Shireen MacArthur, which focused on different ways on the themes of grief. We celebrated virtually the ordination to the Order of Deacons of our very own Susan Erickson on May 23rd. I want to thank you 
I want to thank Jonathan and Mary Margaret Sprinkle for their help with the transition to online services. It has been uh, an immeasurable gift to have them helping us with that transition. I also want to thank our youth readers and our guild of lectors who participate every Sunday in our services. It's such a gift to see those young people proclaiming the gospel and the good news. I also want to thank Eric Irving and Sam, one of our beloved in the desert community members, for their help each and every week providing high quality closed captioning for our services and for closed captioning for the annual meeting videos today. We didn't only worship more, we ended up doing more pastoral care this past year because we all needed it. We had three phone tree efforts in early and late summer and then again in November and December with 30 volunteers calling over 1,000 parishioners each time. Our Eucharistic visitors redirected their ministry to regular contact by phone. Richard Coons quickly moved from in-person weekly Eucharistic visits with Bible study at the Hacienda on the River to weekly virtual Bible study. The St. Philip's 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week pastoral care hotline is now an even more important means of connecting with clergy in emergencies. We did Eucharistic visits throughout the 12 days of Christmas for folks who signed up for a visit. Our health cabinet has continued to meet monthly offering Sunday forums. The prayer shawl ministry continues to knit and mail and deliver shawls and lap blankets to parishioners in need. Liz Weber and the Daughters of the King continue in their vital work of prayer for the church and its clergy. A Joys and Fears of Aging small group has met for the first time on February 16th in Room 10 and then quickly shifted to Zoom and continues weekly. The Haven Mental Health Ministry that once met every Sunday in the Bride's Room now meets every Friday via Zoom. I want to thank Carol Jones and Bill Howe and the whole health cabinet for helping to keep people informed and safe through the pandemic. And I want to thank our deacons for all the work they do. Anne Strong for co-facilitating the weekly Joys and Fears of Aging group. Tom Lindell for coordinating weekly pastoral care efforts including the Eucharistic visitors during Christmas and the weekly prayer chain. Ruthie Hooper for her faithfulness and continuing to pay parishioners calls weekly and helping with our youth and children's programs. Leah Samuel Weiss for her persistent work with PCI and regular presence and ministry at forums. And Susan Erickson for the monthly food drives, the meal train ministry, and leadership with helping to develop a new vision for the parish kitchen, which I'll say a little more about. We moved uh, much of our formation online as well. On Tuesdays, we have a weekly Bible study. On Wednesdays, we have Mosaic. Uh, on Thursdays, we have different classes and forums. And I want to thank Kevin Justice and Julia Annis, who have led multiple Thursday formation offerings. Leah and Jane Prescott-Smith, for who facilitated the summer series on Brueggemann's Journey to the Common Good. And I want to thank those who have participated in the Women's Bible Study for continuing to inspire and care for one another the Daughters of the King for praying for us, and people who have quietly made meals or given money when a need is expressed. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has chosen kindness and patience over frustration with Zoom and all the technical challenges of the year. And thank those who have helped us host and with hospitality in these new ways. We've not only cared for one another within the congregation, we have cared for the wider community. In outreach, we, our beloved in the desert, completed our first cohort in 2019 to 2020 on May 31st, having negotiated the first months of the pandemic and provided housing for young adults for six additional weeks, given the circumstances. We began our second cohort of beloved in the desert folks uh, for 2020 to 2021, and we're now halfway through the year. We have stringent COVID protocols and a helpful and supportive board when we do have a just-in-case isolation or event. Core members continue to serve under strenuous circumstances, supporting often essential services and helping to maintain ministries in the wider community. We are now interviewing for our third cohort for 2021 to 2022, and they are a group of wonderful candidates. Thanks to our partnership and parish generosity, we consistently contribute $30,000 to the church budget that supports staffing, deepening ties to the social justice community, consistent messaging about justice and prayers connection in the wider community, along with the relational gifts of discipleship of the young adults. 
This year has made space for the board of Beloved in the Desert to engage in a process of strategic planning and to make short and long-term goals, including being excellent partners to our nonprofit partners, drilling down on what it is we have to offer and honing in on the type of candidates we are most hopeful to work with. We want to give many thanks to the board of Beloved in the Desert, Jeanette Renouf, Carol Jones, Eileen Beach, Don Beach, Chuck Kirchner, Liz Wood, Beth Burlett, Alex Swain, along with supporters who have prayerfully provided meals and been attentive to and engaged with the community from afar. One of the alumni of beloved Alex Swain has been offering part-time support and will continue that work when Mother Taylor is on maternity leave in May, June, and July. In mid-2020, beloved received a grant for $5,000 uh, for a new Episcopal community, communities from the new Episcopal Communities Office of the National Church for 2020 to 2021. And we received a grant for $1,000 for border ministry from the Office of Young Adult and Campus Ministry. Our feeding ministries have continued to work throughout this past year. We received $10,000 for our kitchen upgrades uh, and to develop a partnership with the Community Food Bank to get us most of the way on a new project with potential for expanding ministry for St. Philip's and with the YWCA and other potential partners. Uh, when we do our outreach discussion in February, uh, we will discuss more in depth about that particular development. It's an exciting one where our kitchen, which often lays, sits dormant during the week, can be used to catalyze new ministries and new possibilities. Our food pantry on Tuesday and Thursday continues to serve both homeless individuals and low-income families throughout the year. Through volunteers and generous donations at drives and by cash gifts, and with a grant secured by Lois for 2020 for $2,000. We saw a dip in visitors at the beginning of the pandemic, but it has picked back up. We did food deliveries to seniors from March through September. And I want to thank all those who donated food, and I especially want to thank Barbara and Ruth for their unfailing help with the food bank. We, can, we began anti-racism efforts this past year, Mother Mary, Mother Paula, uh, can certainly speak more to that in our outreach conversation in February. But we began those groups after the events of June and July, uh, after the death of uh, George Floyd. And it has been a vital time for us to engage the hard work of combating racism, both in our wider communities and in ourselves. We hosted one of the few Martin Luther King events in town, uh, hosting uh, Deacon Joan Crawford. Uh, and that was an event that was eye-opening for many of us. One of the initiatives we launched last January was medical debt relief, and I'm happy to say that we rose to the challenge. In a pandemic year, we gave enough money to forgive $4.2 million in medical debt for families throughout Southern Arizona, 1,800 families in Pima County and beyond. It was one of those things that I think shows just the impact a church can have on the wider community and the concrete, tangible ways we can make a difference in the lives of people who we will never know and never see. Many of you also gave uh, to our Christmas Eve offering, which uh, amounted to around $16,000, which we will give to Prusano Fronteras for border ministry, and another $10,000 was given to the Children's Christmas Project, which is money given to principals in schools to help with needs for those families most in need. I want to thank all of you who gave to those initiatives and efforts. I want to thank the Beloved of the Desert Board, uh, the folks who have helped sustain our food pantry, Barbara, Ruth, and Nancy Atherton. I want to thank our feeding ministries working group that has coordinated Sunday food drives, the kitchen development project, and has deepening ties to our community. That includes Deacon Susan Erickson, Landon Swanson, Mary Norman, Don and Eileen Beach, Liz Wood, Donna Palmer, Michael Anderson, Barbara Bogan, Ruth Campbell, Nancy Atherton, Alex Swain, Alan Cooley, Marianne Cooley, Lee Shaw, Catherine Mock and John Berman. Susan Erickson and Landon and John Berman, I want to thank them for their research on and support of the Kitchen Development Project specifically. And Father, I want to thank Father Henry, Shereen MacArthur, Mary Trainer, and Paula Barker, and Alex Swain for coordinating our anti-racism efforts. All of that work has happened while we have been trying to worship online, and a significant portion of that it has to do with our music program. Leading the music ministry 
during the COVID crisis has been an immense challenge for Justin and Jeffrey and required fundamental adjustments uh, throughout most of 2020. Their work has involved liturgical and technological and pastoral changes that have affected our vision for the year ahead too. Thankfully, through the year, Jeffrey and Justin continue to fulfill their vocation to St. Philip's worship, invigorating liturgies with choral and instrumental music. At the end of March, responding to the realities of COVID and the need for social isolation, they moved all choir rehearsals online. They began investigating ways to move into the digital reality of pre-recorded services in order to offer choral music and hymnody. With the help of the wonderful lay clerks, they experimented and learned various ways to capture voices and mix them in a virtual choir recording format in both audio and visually. They discovered there is a fairly steep learning curve and an adjustment necessary for many musicians to adapt to this creative process. We also learned that we would need better equipment to do this work competently and invested in hardware and high quality microphones. They also discovered the process is time consuming and indeed, all ministry areas have confirmed that producing digital service materials takes an enormous amount of time. It takes around, as an aside, it takes probably 100 hours of combined work for, to produce every Sunday morning service. That's from editing, recording, mixing all of the audio. It's an enormous undertaking. With the help of our sizable choir community this fall, we have modulated to contribute in many more voices, uh, though this has required focusing exclusively on audio production and not the video. They experimented with various methods for capturing digital recordings, including a system developed by the American Choral Directors Association called My Choral Coach. The weekly rehearsals for adults and youth have helped connect folks who otherwise would have limited contact and have forged a link with the weekly youth formation opportunities that Father Mark organizes as well. The natural anxiety associated with weekly online meetings and the demoralizing effect of self-recording have meant that a substantial element of the work that Justin and Jeffrey do is pastoral work, encouraging folks to do their best and to be patient and to try and learn new skills. And I'm happy to say that so many in our choir have risen to that challenge. The need to produce recordings together with the need for live streaming events has led us to invest in high quality cameras and microphones for the church and invest in the upgrade of our Wi-Fi capability in the church so that when we do resume in-person services in the church, we will still be able to live stream those services for those folks who are not able to make it to church. Our choir community produced music for services throughout the fall, including an extraordinary amount of material for All Saints Day, for Christmas Eve, uh, the latter of which involved collaborations with local, local instrumentalists. We want to thank again Jonathan Sprinko, who helped immeasurably to create a live streaming system for concerts and services and has tested various configurations of those cameras and microphones in the fall. Moving into 2021, as COVID numbers have risen, we will continue to provide music for online services through the spring months. If the pandemic decreases in intensity, we hope to move back to live services and eventually resume our system of live choral music and first Sunday music. We can't wait to see our newly refurbished organ console be reinstalled by Quimby Pike, Pike Organs after January 20th. And the update to our console and organs electronics have been an enormous project in 2020. And we have relied on an electronic organ for service music since the early fall. I don't know how many of you have noticed that. The Friends of Music plans to live stream spring Sunday concerts and a series of young artist concerts during Lent. And when conditions allow, we will look forward to inviting the Latvian composer Eric Eschenbols to the premiere of his new composition, the St. Philip's Misa Brevis, which Corky Gabbard and the Friends of Music have commissioned. The date of that premiere is forthcoming. Our choirs have been invited to sing a Compline service for the Royal School of Church Music in America's three-day virtual summer course, the Spirit's Tether, on July 16th, and our youth choristers can also participate in that online course this year. Our St. Nicholas Choir and Scola Cantorum have been invited to be the visiting choir at Wells Cathedral in July of 2022. And the choir recently started a UK residency committee which hopes to raise funds to make this choral residency possible for our youth. I want to thank several folks involved in music. First, I want to thank Aidan Carroll, who has selflessly helped with literally anything. And he is a servant and an example of humility that has helped us 
over and over and over again. We're setting up and taking down for our concerts and recordings. Of course, we want to thank Bonnie Wynn, Laura Rubo, and Julie Gibson for continuing to support Dr. Campbell and Jeffrey and Justin in every way possible during the last year. Bonnie has been an ongoing leader in all things pertaining to the UK residency plan, in addition to being a leader in so many other areas of our parish life. We also want to thank David Haas, the chair of Friends of Music and the Friends of Music Board for their continued interest in and physical support of music at St. Philip's. The last area I want to speak a little bit about is children, youth, and family. We've moved formation online and we have gotten emails and letters from folks who have said how much it means for their kids to be able to participate in Sunday services and Sunday formation. Our Children, Youth, and Family Ministry was also part of the development of the diocesan anti-racism curriculum that they're using in level three of Children, Youth, and Family Formation. They're beginning to implement a reimagining of youth formation structures even as things are online. And we are highlighting the children and youth voices in the proclamation of the word and worship through the Guild of Lectors. We've moved comfy space services online. Online, we have Wednesday board game night and Saturday D&D &D game nights for community building. We had visits from St. Nicholas to households around the city for families who signed up for it. We did a St. Francis Day service outside in the parking lot and it worked and we had an incredible pet food drive uh, to benefit SAAF. And finally, the work this past year has been, in children, youth, and family in particular, has been to support what we would call the domestic church, the church of our own home. This is the year when we have all tried to figure out what it means to be faithful, not just in the church building, but just in our living room. How do we worship and pray and care for one another? How do we do that work of being a domestic church? And that's been an emphasis of our children, youth, and family program. This year, we produced a, a children and choir a Christmas welcome, where the children read to us the night before Christmas and the choir sang a hymn that we used as a video welcome that we sent out to the wider community that was viewed probably around 40,000 times by people around uh, Southern Arizona. We were able to do our Children's Christmas Eve pageant online this year, and I want to thank Sonia, Carrie, Jonathan, and the parents and kids who participated in that. There are things that are upcoming. We're working on a drive-in movie uh, for the spring. There is a Wright 13 letter to the Philippians that's being developed in which the Wright 13 group will write a letter to the church in the voice of St. Paul following a study of Philippians. And we're working on developing a ministry with neurodiverse children, planning a conference that will be restarted here uh, this year. We want to thank Miss Harriet, Deacon Ruthie for all of their work in the atriums, Carrie, Sonia, and Jonathan for the work on the pageant and so much more. Mother Jean and Miss Elizabeth Brown for the constancy of their presence in comfy space, for their gifts freely shared and for their support. We want to thank Brother Aiden and Virginia Catt for their leadership and love of our children and youth. And we want to thank all the parents and children who have struggled with these times and are discovering what it means to be the domestic church. You will have heard that we have done a lot in this past year and there is a lot more to come. Our hope is to use our Sunday morning Q&A sessions in February to go more deeply into what we hope for in this coming year, to have a discussion with you about what has worked in this past year, what you hope to see coming, and that will help us to develop some sort of strategy for handling this coming year as we, God willing, transition back to in-person services. I want to conclude just with a thought and then a prayer. Noted theologian and philosopher Mike Tyson says of boxing that everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Our nation and our community and our churches took a punch with COVID this past year. We all had plans and ideas about how the year would unfold, and it didn't unfold like we thought it would. Yet we come to the beginning of this new year, we come to it as we always have, gathered in love, transformed by grace, and sent to serve. I want to thank each and every one of you for being part of the community of, uh, of care at St. Philip's. And I'm going to close with a prayer. The Lord be with you. O God of unchangeable power and eternal life, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, 
and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.